Great. Thank you so much, Susie. I think some really important points. Um, starting with um, the point you made about inclusion um, and needing to be really intentional about that. And Dr. Whiteside and, and Adam, I'd love uh, to kind of ask you guys to, to kind of build on that. And how are you thinking about inclusion in these spaces um, in a very intentional way? And we'll start uh, Dr. Whiteside. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, one of the key points that you know, hit home when we're including people with lived experience and evaluating how we want to respond to social media to a suicidal post. And people said, you know, above all else, I really would prefer if a friend or family member reached out to me directly if they were concerned. And the problem being that often friends do not necessarily know what to say or how to say it. And if you move to risk identification, you know, through, um, uh, machine learning, you know, what, what does that entail too? If this person really prefers this type of, uh, of research, reach out and how do we involve family members and friends? But I think it's that kind of insight that um, is useful. And that led to, you know, one of the offerings of Facebook's flow for when you're, you know, flagging someone else's post to say, Hey, why don't you send them a message? And here's an example message that, that you could send. Um, and it takes some work to think about how that applies in, uh, in I proactively identifying people with um, algorithms. Great. Adam? Yeah, uh, I think the idea of inclusion in these types of um, innovations that we're trying to develop and, and navigate and understand is paramount. I think, uh, you know, the type of intervention that is gonna be most appropriate for each person is really gonna vary. And so if we're establishing policies that are black and white in nature um, and not engaging people to discuss what those policies are or what the implications of them might be, we can set ourselves up for really disastrous consequences. Uh, at the last webinar, I think it was cited that uh, at some point Facebook had reported 6,500 home visits for a wellness check and crisis text line had um, had around 11,000 home visits uh, for a wellness check. Uh, you know, I'm not one to say whether that was the right or wrong response, but I am someone to say, what are the implications of that? And are we talking to folks who have had that type of experience and asking, you know, was that the most appropriate intervention? Um, you know, how was your network included in this? Was your network included? Um, you know, what might be the unintended implications of this at a very serious level? And if we're not having those discussions and if we're not inviting people who have actually lived through the experience to the table, I think we're missing a lot of opportunities to create unique and diverse approaches that really focus on building community and building relationships and connectedness. And we know that connectedness is one of the greatest prevention tools that we have in our toolbox, right? So why can't we uh, uh, build systems that allow that connectedness to occur by including a myriad of voices at the table as we're developing policies and procedures uh, that kind of govern what our reactions are to these type of situations? Great. Thanks, Adam. And, and you talked a little bit more about, about network and would love to kind of continue to build on that as well. Um, Susie and, and Ursula, how are you guys thinking about that network, both that online um, direct network on social media or on a different platform, um, as well as the network um, in the lives of, of someone um, who might be struggling and how that might um, inform data science efforts? Thank you. I loved Adam's point, and I think that that's so so crucial because he's right. I mean, these individuals that are surrounded by people, it's the people that are around them that can provide a lot of that connectedness, right? And often there's this fear of what if I say the wrong thing or I don't even know what to say. And then we have to take into account that virtual communication is very different than face-to-face -face or in-person communication, right? So are we accommodating these differences in how we communicate and how we share language and how we share understanding? And even culturally, again, that understanding in that language changes, right? So as far as what I think, I think that, again, just to echo both what Dr. Whiteside and what um, Mr. Swanson have said, it's really important that we just bring people to the table 
and have these conversations because we need to get family members, we need to get friends, we need to get communities on board and say, what are you needing to do this to help people, right? What don't you have? But what do you have as well? And how can we support those things? Because if we're already identifying thousands of people and sending out welfare checks, what's going to happen once this really rolls out? And uh, when 988 rolls out and that capacity is beyond what our systems can truly handle. Because I will tell you right now on the ground side, law enforcement agencies are overtaxed and they're understaffed and they're not ideal for a lot of these wellness checks, right? We need more mental health professionals. We need more individuals who can actually help and offer care. And in my community, in my state, it's, it's a very rural area and we simply don't have enough of either. So our supports, our, our best supports and our best gap fillers are going to be those peer supports, those community members, those family and those friends. And, and they need basic education. They need, they need to know how to do these things. So if we're going to roll out opportunity for intervention, we need to ensure that people know how to do those interventions on the, at the same time. Otherwise, we have set a lot of people up for a lot of trauma and grief and a lot of other things that I know that no one here wants to do. So thank you. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, as I was listening to the last webinar, um, I was thinking about some of the thoughts and recommendations that people came up with and having observed social media companies uh, like to grapple with these things, many of them they have, they have considered, but it's not clear how they, they made those decisions and how much of lived experience was involved in that decision-making process. And uh, like going back to, you know, my first slide, it's like, oh my God, the opportunity, the possibilities, you know, in a night, in a limitless world, you know, we would all on Facebook have our, you know, a team, our top list of people that are most important to us. We'd have, have identified them and, you know, they're, and consented to the fact that, that, you know, Facebook might let them know if they're concerned about us. Maybe that's an ideal world. That we, That's a question to be asked, but, you know, th there are these possibilities for things that that we know have the potential to increase connection and in the moment so it's this immediacy of how do how do we get this to happen now like I, I I can tell in the flow of the experience on Facebook you know when somebody's post has been flagged uh, especially if it's a, a reactive it's a family member or friend it may take some time for that person to get a response um, but with the like, with a proactive approach, you know, th there's opportunity for other experiences and, um, you know, reaching out to people who've previously been identified, um, but just some thoughts. Great. Um, and we have a question from um, one of the participants around machine learn learning algorithms, um, which has come up in, in our discussion so far. And the question is, Really, from, from your perspective um, and from the perspective of people with lived experience, when someone first showed you the suicide risk predicted by a machine learning algorithm, what were your initial reactions um, as things started moving in this direction? And I'll kind of, I'll, I'll throw that out, Ursula, I'll start mm -hmm. with you. I, I mean, I think my experience reflects, you know, what I've seen in the lived experience community um, and just seen verbalized on social media as, as both things. Like one, we have this opportunity to help somebody and we've missed so many people who needed help. By God, why wouldn't we take advantage of this? And then on the other end of the dialectic is that's also scary, <laughs> you know, and who's going to own the social media company tomorrow, right? And what are they going to do with this data and how is it going to be used? Um, and is that going to be impersonal? And, and is it going to feel, you know, like a bot? And that there's not compassion and caring that, that goes into it. So, you know, there's not an answer, but I, I see the that both of this tension, um, you know, of both of these things at the same time. Thank you. Susan or Adam, any thoughts on the question around kind of your initial reaction um, when hearing about machine learning algorithms and suicide risk? Well, yeah, I, I think I have some serious concerns about it, partic particularly when we think about what is the response of the network or what is the response of the 
algorithm, right? When we work within health systems, uh, oftentimes we're talking about um, what's our standard operating procedure, what's our protocol, right? Uh, social media companies, from what I can tell, work in very similar ways. If, if we're noticing, uh, if something is flagged, what is the process that goes into forming a response uh, and how, um, how comprehensive has that process been? Uh, you know, I have not seen uh, very many social media companies at very big stakeholder meetings um, a, a, across the nation, right? Like there's a divide between who's having the conversation. And so I think my concern is really um, how are we building, how are the algorithms, what, what is the policy and procedure attached to the algorithm? And, and who's making that decision? And folks in leadership positions within those organizations, how are they informed on these topics? And, and how are they guiding what those policies and procedures should be? Uh, I don't think we can rely on machine learning uh, to say with certainty what is happening in someone's life. Uh, we're taking, my new pieces of data from all over the place uh, and making assumptions about what that data could mean. Uh, so I would just encourage us to think a bit more comprehensively about the full spectrum of a human experience and not just what's being clicked on on the internet uh, and, and developing an approach that really responds to that full spectrum. And then I'll, I'll again kind of echo what Dr. Whiteside said. I, I... I felt both things, I, I, I think, overwhelm, not only in a negative or positive way, because there's so much potential here to help. But again, you know, what are those implications? So I think, too, thinking about those individuals and those voices and just language. Language is so nuanced, right? And we all know as survivors and people who work in suicide that people don't often tell us, I'm going to take my life, I'm going to die by suicide. And they, they often use language that could be interpreted in many different ways. So if we're talking about machine learning, is it nuanced? Is it going to account for that? Is it going to pick up that subtlety? And what if it picks up the wrong subtlety? So, you know, I, again, like what um, Mr. Swanson has said, you know, I think we need to be really comprehensive in how we look at this. And I think that that means that we need more people at the table. We need more conversation and discussion around what this could look like. Great. Uh, we got another question um, thinking about the audience um, and that suicide risk is elevated in older adults as well. And so sometimes the social media conversation focuses on a particular um, age group. So just uh, I think the question being, um, how can social media be used to reach all um, audiences or older adults that maybe are at elevated risk as well? Any thoughts on um, kind of how, how people are interacting with social media at different stages of life and how that might, um, or is it now, you know, all stages of life? Um, Colleen, one of the things I've been thinking about is, um, you know, the, the technology is at the point where we can understand what is happening within a community uh, we might not know literally what's happening, but we can get a sense of the type of environment that's being fostered or occurring. For example, let's say a suicide occurs in a school district. Um, you know, there, chances are you can tell through the data that there is a crisis of sorts within that community. My question would be, how are these platforms then responding to that hotspot? How are we building in a community approach? So if we can see uh, a person, an individual, or a member of a community, um, you know, raising certain flags, getting th their, you know, number on a rating system going up, uh, what types of interventions are we providing again to that network? So if we have an older person who is using social media, who has, you know, triggered some type of alert within the algorithm, how are we then using the network that has been built around that person in a social media space to then offer support? What does that look like? Uh, and how are we using the tools that have been created to offer that support? Uh, I think that's where my question would lie. 
Thank you, Adam. Um, another question has come in around um, the data and the information. Um, and Ursula, I think you started to, to touch on this a little bit. Um, but the question being, there's little regulation on how social media companies use um, some of the machine learning tools that they have. And how can we trust the, these companies with sensitive suicide risk information? And how are, how are you and others thinking about um, that angle of the, the information that they have? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I may not have the exact right words for this, but I think there's not a ton of incentive for social media companies to be transparent as a one-off um, because, uh, you know, there's a, um, there's a lot of, you know, news that goes into social media messing up. And so I think that the, this kind of goes back to the, like the legislation around this type of thing that, um, if people, if if this is you know, what uh, is expected, and that transparency comes first, like you know, number one, you need to explain how you came to this and what the process is, and everybody has to do that. That 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 changes the game, and that that's a first step. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, and Adam, I think this builds a little bit on what you were saying, but what are suggestions from the panel on how to integrate community input with data analytics and building machine learning algorithms? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great question to ask. Uh, if we know, for instance, that a hotspot is occurring in a community, uh, I can think of several instances where we've had, let's say, a cluster of youth suicides in a community, a tragic situation. How are we then allowing the community to build awareness, right? How are we, um, how are we using the tools of machine learning to say something's happening here and maybe we need to provide some type of information about crisis resources in the community? I think the other thing we need to consider is uh, what Mark Mason discussed at the first webinar, which is a soft handoff intervention. What are the community entities that are not, you know, possibly harmful uh, to call upon um, in a time of intervention? What does a soft, uh, a soft handoff intervention look like? Uh, in addition, I'm wondering, um, you know, the amount of money that we hear about is passing through some of these large corporations. There could be staff on, on hand to provide support and to provide that kind of intervention that is not escalated to the point of potentially causing harm. Um, so I guess I would, I would suggest that we try to center community voices and try to get social media companies and representatives actually involved in communities. Uh, I know that's a difficult task, but there's a lot of resources there and a lot of, uh, a lot of people interested in making this type of work happen. Thanks, Adam. Susie, thoughts on how to integrate community input? I really like what you just said, Adam. I think that having someone on staff, and then that kind of ties back into what Ursula said earlier, right? Talking about funding lived experience voices, whether that's through um, actual financial opportunity or through legislative support, right? So we know when we have someone housed within an organization that is dedicated to the work, that the work is going to more than likely be done, right? And so how can we support that? And, and so if you were to identify those who have that lived experience and you have that passion and investment and you employ them in this opportunity, wouldn't that kind of be a blending of the, the, the best of both worlds in a way? And of course, I mean, that's not going to be the only solution, but I think that it's, it's a first start at looking at how we could kind of bring both sides to the table. And that then as a survivor, that gives me comfort a little bit, right? Because I know that you're talking to people like me who have a personal investment and concern similar to my own. So ensuring that you're really elevating these voices, I mean, we have to start considering what that really means and the practicality of the sense. Yeah, and I would just add, um, you know, one of the things when I when social media companies seem to be evaluating how to be helpful is they want to be careful not to fall into the category of healthcare. And when they start offering interventions or direct support services, um, you know, there's that it, there's a lot that comes with that. And so 
what they've done is contracted with organizations like or connected people to suicide prevention lifeline or the crisis text line but we know that those services are also often very underfunded so there needs to be you know support um either you know for contracted organizations greater support for them both federal and through social media companies i think to support this immediate type of one-on-one -on -one intervention that that may be offered when somebody is identified through a risk algorithm Right. So a lot of key themes, I think, have come up um, in our in our time together this morning. We talked about inclusion. Uh, we talked about impact. Uh, we talked about network and defining the network and community input into the development of processes and protocols and, and data points. Um, I think, Susie, it was you who mentioned kind of the role of linguistics and the language um, people are using and um, the diversity of experiences. Um, we talked a little bit about what it looks like on the response side and what is the input and tailoring to the response um, to meet the needs of the individual in, in crisis, potentially in crisis, um, or the networks around them. Um, and I think a number of these topics are gonna be explored throughout today and some of the other um, presentations, um, but this is a really helpful way to kind of ground us as we go into the rest of the conversations of the day. Um, but I just want to go kind of one last um, time through by uh, through the panel. We have about a minute left and just kind of a final thought that you'd like um, people to take away from this panel as they're listening to the rest of uh, this series. So Adam, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. I think the, the question I just want to put out there are, how are we using this tool to show what caring action looks like in real time? I think there are very few situations where we have access to this type of data and this type of information. So how are we using that to empower communities to support people who are experiencing a crisis? Adam, Susie? I just want to say, I think when we're having these discussions and talking about these types of efforts, the, the simplest thing is to look around and say, who's not here that needs to be here? And how can we invite them into this conversation and actually listen to what they have to say? Thank you. And Dr. Whiteside. Yeah, I think my thought would be, um, let's not be cynical, let's be savvy. And by cynical, you know, Let's assume best intentions about the people who care about these issues within social media companies and understand that they have people above them and organizational priorities and lawyers who have other priorities and that they, they may need the support from legislation in order to focus their energy, time and money on these particular issues. Um, but that doesn't mean we turn a critical eye away from the work. Um, we need to request transparency and we need to be an at the table, lived experience needs to be at the table as, as a rule. Great, well, thank you all so much again for being here.